Welcome to my talk, The T-Wise Independence of Substitution Permutation Networks. I'm Tianren. This is a joint work with Stefano and Vinort. A central problem in crypto is to construct random looking kitty permutations. Tons of works are targeting this problem. Among these works, there's a well-known, well not so well-defined gap between theory and practice. The theory work called this object a pseudo-random permutation, and they focus on security based on well-studied assumptions. The practice work called this object a block cipher. They are okay with heuristical security, the first priority is being super efficient. I'm not saying the theory work don't care about efficiency or the practical work don't care about proof. Just as we all know, this gap exists, and it seems very hard to bridge it. In the literature, we already have proof of secure PRP based on one-way function, factoring, or lattice problems. Unfortunately, none of them is fast enough to be practical. In practice, people use much more efficient block ciphers such as AES. Of course, everyone, everyone want to understand whether AES is secure. From the theory perspective, we want to base AES on hardness assumptions. But we don't know how to do it. We don't even have a candidate assumption. Many theory work then try to argue the security of AES or similar ciphers in some idealized models. But still, this work are not analyzing the actual block ciphers. When we got stuck proving security against arbitrary attacks, the next best thing we can hope for is to identify classes of attacks and to prove they cannot succeed with good probability. To show this in a picture, the community has already identified many classes of attacks. Previous work shows AES can resist some certain classes of attacks to some extent. In this paper, we promote the study of TY's independence, which is a desired property of block ciphers. When T equals 2, it already implies resistance to several known attacks, including linear and differential attacks. Larger T implies resistance to more attacks. T-wise independence is a very natural property. For any T inputs, the corresponding T outputs should be ID uniform. We will use a relaxed form. The corresponding T outputs should be epsilon close to uniform in statistical distance. Okay. For feasibility, the key lines has to be at least T times the output lines. This requirement can be ensured by the standard assumption of independent round key, which is assumed in almost every work in the field, especially starting AES. From the theory perspective, T wise independence means security against unbounded adversary who makes at most T queries. Notice that Linear and differential attacks relies on correlation within two queries. So, in some sense, these attacks are captured by an adversary that makes only two queries. Similarly, degree two differential attacks can be captured by an adversary that makes only two to the D queries. Therefore, T wise independence implies resistance to all these attacks and to any attacks that uh, relies on correlations among a few queries. Quantitatively, we show a tight relation between the closeness to two wise independence and the resistance to linear and differential attacks. Now, I'm going to give a brief overview on the cipher design KC and SPN and the concrete cipher AES. I guess they are familiar to most audience. To encrypt an input using KC, 
First, XOR it with a round key. Then apply a fixed and public permutation. Then repeat this process. This is called round be repeated around many times to get the output. SPN is a special case of KC. It also tells you how to construct this fixed permutation. First, divide the input into a few small blocks. Apply a small permutation called SBox to every block. Then, mix the output using a linear function. Both operations are very efficient. The SBox can be complicated, but it's only over a small domain. The linear function is over a large domain, but it's very simple. Then AES. AES is a special case of SPN. The block is 8 bit long, and uh, the S box is the inverse function. Here, I ignore some technical details that are not important for understanding. So, R run the KC has R plus 1 round keys. Actually, it is also true for SPN or AES. And therefore, it cannot be R plus 2 wise independent due to length of randomness. Our positive result almost matches this, this bound. We show that R round KC is close to slightly smaller than R wise independent. This is an extension result and is proved by a probabilistic method. I would like to emphasize here that the difference between our result and the ideal model results. In ideal model results, pi is typically modeled as random permutations, to which the adversary only have all causes. Well, in our result, pi is public and it's completely known to the adversary. Okay, this is our result for KC. For SPN, say there are k blocks each has a b bits. We consider the s box being inverse, which is used by AES, or cube, which is used by MIMIC. For these s boxes, we show two round SPN is close to two S independence and three round SPN is even closer to two S independence. We also show six round AES, the extra S round. There's no idealization at all. It's 0.472 close to two S independence. Compare with previous work. Uh, the state of art PSSL shows 4 on the AES is pointwise close to 2 independence. Our result don't imply PSSL because they are considering a stronger notion of closeness. And PSSL don't imply our result because our bound is much tighter. Because our bound is tight enough, in particular, because it's smaller than a half, and it can be amplified. By increasing the number of rounds, AES will be exponentially close to twice independent. Okay. So these are our these are our results. In the rest of the talk, I'm to I'm going to give a technical overview on our proof. For KC, we show R round KC is close to slightly less than R by independence. We prove it by induction. Say we have something that is t-wise independent. What if we compose it with one round of KC? The composition will be close to t plus one wise independence. We call this independence amplification lemma, and we prove this using probabilistic, a probabilistic argument. Okay. Here we saw the notion pointwise closeness again. It means the two uh, the t outputs should be close to uniform not only in L1 distance but also in L infinity distance. That is, 
their probability mass their their probability mass function should be close to uniform on every point. Because this notion is stronger, it's meaningful even if epsilon is much larger than one, which is the case we consider. Okay. In our extraction lemma, the condition f being t by its independence can be relaxed to f being close to t by its independence. Uh, the resulting distance will increase proportionally. The independence amplification lemma already implies something interesting. Okay, zero around Kc, which is one time pad, it's one one less independence. Then by repeatedly applying independence um, in, independence amplification, R around Kc is somewhat close to R plus one wise independence. The distance is huge, but this, this is already a non-trivial result. This can be complemented by another lemma we call it. Uh, distance amplification lemma, which is also proved by probabilistic method. See, f is very close to t by its independence, and it's some clo somewhat close to t plus 1 by its independence. Then adding one more round will make it very close to t plus 1 by its independence. Okay, now we are ready to prove our case theory result. It's the two-dimension induction I'll show it in a table. The base case is one-wise independence. Any round of cases is one-wise independence. Applying the independence, C, independence amplification lemma, R round case C is somewhat close to R plus one-wise independence. Then applies the distance amplification lemma by adding a few more rounds, somewhat closeness will become very close. Okay. This concludes the proof. Next, I'm going to show how SPN and AS are close to two wise independence. Because this involves only two inputs, a nice observation is that only the difference matters here. What does it mean? Let me open the SPN for a bit. Fit the two input into SPN. After XORing the first round key, the only remaining information is their difference, right? Okay, similarly for output, we care about the distribution of the two outputs. The joint distribution of the two output is close to uniform if and only if the, dis uh, the difference is close to uniform. Okay. So we only need to care about the difference. In SPN, S box is the only nonlinear operation. We need to understand how it maps input difference to output difference. Formally speaking, given two inputs of different data, what is the, dif what is the distribution of the output difference? We started the case when the S-box is inverse or cube. For this S-boxes, the output difference is a random vector orthogonal to the input difference. So in the picture, we can replace the S-box with a process that samples from the orthogonal subsidies. This might sound too good to be true, and uh, it's actually not exactly true, okay. but, but almost. One exception is when delta equals zero. When the input difference is zero means the inputs are the same. In such case, the outputs must also, must also be the same. Okay. I also ignore some other technical details in the picture. Uh, these details are not important in the, in the photo proof. You can find them in the paper, but please ignore them for now. Okay. Say we feed a non-zero input difference to subspace sampling process. 
Then the output must has high mean entropy. The output difference will affect the next round's input difference. Okay. So what if the input difference has high entropy? We are in the next round now. As we proved in what we called extraction lemma, in such case, the output difference is close to uniform. We prove it by further analysis, and we later find an alternative proof using elementary method. So this can be generalized to consider multiple blocks together, as long as each input block has high entropy. The joint distribution of the output block is close to uniform. Okay. So the most important bit here uh, is that the input difference don't have to be independent. They can have arbitrary correlations. They can, for example, they can be all equal. We only require the marginal distribution to have high entropy. Okay. So we also have a stronger extraction lemma. Says if every subset of input blocks has high mean entropy. Again, they can have any correlation as long as any subset of input block has high mean entropy. The output will be very close to uniform. Okay, so quantitatively, this improve by a factor of, uh, but it, 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 this improve exponentially in k. Okay. Now we are ready to show the the main result. Okay. So here is a SPN. As we just discussed. All the S boxes can be replaced by subspace sampling. The input difference is non zero somewhere. Then, subspace sampling gives you high entropy. The linear function will propagate the entropy to all blocks. Here, star means uh, the linear function has to uh, satisfy a, a property that it's all of its coefficients are non-zero. In particular, this is not satisfied by AS, but uh, let's say the entropy is propagated to all blocks. Then we can apply extraction lemma as the condition is satisfied. Remember, the only thing we need is that each in input block individually has high entropy. Therefore, two rounds a SPN is close to two S independent. To show a tighter bound, let's retreat one step. The delta two column all has high mean entropy, which means with high probability, they are all non-zero. Okay. Then subspace sampling gives you high entropy, independently on each block. You can think that the delta two call uh, the delta two prime column to be all independent. This is not exactly true but uh, can be formalized. Okay. Then after the last mix last linear mixing, it's not hard to show that every subset of the delta three column has high entropy. Here, we only require the linear function to be invertible. Okay. Now the condition of strong extraction line might satisfy. Again, this is all we need. Every subset has high entropy. There can be any correlation. Therefore, we show three-round SPN. It's very close to two-wise independence. Similarly, by making our hands dirty, we can prove six round AS is close to two wise independence. Remember, we also have the almost tight result for KC. Here are all we prove. Okay. Let me finish the talk with a summary slide. The T wise independence has a really rich body of problems we find there, and we only touch the surface. For example, uh, independence amplification is something we don't find in previous work. 
Can you show three wise independence of some existing concrete cipher? Uh, of course, our result is substantial, so we probably need some brand new technique. Key scheduling. We and almost every work in the field assume independent round keys. That is also the only idealization we use. Is it possible to say something meaningful while taking the key scheduling into account? Okay. Uh, the relationship between TY's independence and other attacks. T TY's independence might imply resistances to more attacks. On the other hand, when you're looking for attacks on AES, you should probably avoid those attacks that relies on correlation based on fewer self attacks because we know AES is to some extent uh, too wise independent. Okay. And finally, can you analyze other concrete cipher design? For example, they are, uh, uh, for example, like uh, ARX. And uh, that's all I want to share today. Thank you for listening.